really happy to have him back here this year. Who has lies, my doctor told me? Look at that, Ken. Everybody have an autograph? I'm looking for the hands of work right. Oh, I live with him, so I've got it. <laughs> so one thing I think that Ken does really, really well is he cuts through the muck muck. It's why we love you so much because there's a Dr. Barry video for that pretty much on any topic. Remember when the whole stupid Thank you for keto crotch? Keto yeah. crotch that, thank you, I'm coming. Keto crotch. Did you hear this in the news? The keto crotch? It was a total, uh, actually 39 times. Actually, it was a totally made up story paid for by a PR firm that works for Weight Watchers and Oprah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. You. And this man exposed them. So did I, by the way. But this man exposed them. And we need people like this to help us cut through what's real news and what's fake news. So let's hear a lecture about that, Ken. Here is Dr. Ken Berry. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming on the cruise and thanks for being here and not ditching this hour. <laughs> Sad when you look out there and it's just crickets chirping. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to definitely touch on how you can tell what's real and what's not. And I also want to talk quite a bit today. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Yes. You good? Okay. I want to talk about the use of language because it's very important. A lot of people miss this. And so we talk about things and we use certain words and you can, you can actually lose all your power if you use the wrong word. Or you can gain lots of extra power if you use the right word. So we're gonna talk about all that stuff today. So let's go. So my disclosures, just so you know, I don't, uh, I, I've got the book, I do social media, I have a Patreon account. Um, and I'm still waiting for either Big Food or Big Pharma to, to approach me about some kind of sponsorship. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, we're, we're waiting by the phone, but I still, I'm still waiting for that. And so let me tell you, just if, if, if you don't, if, you, if you've never seen me on YouTube or wherever, let me tell you a little about me. I'm board certified family medicine doctor. Been practicing since 2000. And uh, in a very small community in Tennessee, kind of Middle West Tennessee, I've seen tens of thousands of patients, both in the emergency department, labor and delivery, uh, ICU, CCU, uh, NICU, and then obviously the most in my clinic. I, at my worst, at my most metabolically ill, I was 297 pounds, had an A1C of 6.1, had severe daily reflux, dandruff, rosacea, my knees ached every single day I got out of bed, I had a fatty liver, and my baseline was pissed off. <laughs> if I won the lottery, I was pissed off about the taxes. <laughs> Literally, every single day of my life, every single thing made me mad. And I think I had a, quite a bit of inflammation of certain parts of my brain as well. Back then. And I think that's why um, Nisha wouldn't tolerate that. And then also I think my diet helped a little bit too. So that's me. And you can actually, you can see the, the gut and you can see the double chin and you can see the facial inflammation and maybe even a touch of the rosacea in that picture. That's why I picked that. And that's a total fake shot. That's not, she's not really giving me that. I'm not sure what's in that. It's like blood. All right, so let's talk about doctors and why they give you just idiotic nutrition advice. Let's talk about that. And then why, why do doctors feel compelled to give you nutrition advice. Why, why is that? That's a good question. And then we'll go from there. So just me personally, I had a one hour class, even one or two days a week, I can't remember, for half a semester of my four year medical school career. And 90% of that was talking about how to totally feed someone who was unconscious in the ICU. Right? Yeah. That's important. Doctors need to know that. And, and, and if, you, if you've been in a rollover and broken 14 bones and you're unconscious in the ICU, Doctors are great at feeding you to keep you from dying and to keep you from starting to develop skin breakdown and all that stuff. We're really good at that. Or if you've had a, a third degree burn over 40% of your body and you're in the burn unit, you need a lot more fluids and you need a lot more protein and other things and we're very good at that. There's calculations for all that. But when it comes to the care and feeding of just regular folks, doctors suck at that because they're just not taught. We're, not, we're, we're actually implicitly taught that it's not even anything to worry about. That humans are somehow magic. You can feed them whatever. 
you know, if your dog's sick and you go to the vet, the vet wants to know what are you feeding that dog. But that doesn't apply to humans. It's different somehow. Like we're special or magic. And we're all mammals. And what we eat matters. And so the sum total of my nutrition education, you're looking at it right here, it was a half, it was a paperback book about that thick. And then a half semesters of notes, which in med school is about that thick as well. And, and I can sum it up in three sentences. I eat lots of whole grains. Eat lots of uh, vegetables. Uh, don't eat any saturated fat. And junk. Literally, that's my nutrition education for people like you who are conscious and aware and walking around. But everybody knows implicitly or explicitly that nutrition is the foundation of health. It's the bedrock that you build your entire body and, and mind and life on. Doctors know that they should know this. We just know. I should know how to tell this person. They're like, well, what diet should I follow? We, we feel compelled. And obviously patients expect us to know. That's why they ask us, even though that's a bad strategy. To ask your doctor what diet you should follow, they still do. So let's look at this. This is a study from the, the Journal of the American College of Nutrition back in 08. They surveyed a bunch of internal medicine interns. So they just graduated med school. And they're in their first year of residency. 77% of those guys said that, that nutrition assessment should be included in a routine primary care visit. 94% agreed that it was their obligation to discuss nu nutrition with their patients. And 14% felt adequately, <coughs> adequately prepared to do that. Okay? But you can see even these young doctors, almost to a man and a woman, they knew, I, I, that's my job. I, see, I should know about nutrition. But then only 10%, 15% felt adequately trained. They surveyed medical schools in 2010. 30% required a dedicated nutrition course. So 70% has no nutrition course whatsoever. Okay, you would just pick up those calculations for the intensive care unit in your residency rotation. That's where you get that. Medical students on average receive 22 contact hours of nutrition during their entire career as a medical student. And only 38% of the schools met the minimum 25 hour required hours set by the National Academy of Sciences. So there are guidelines for this, but only a third of the schools are meeting the guidelines. Okay? So the question comes, I mean, obviously doctors are ignorant of how to feed and care for a, a, a relatively healthy human being. So should we even ask them for nutrition advice? That's a valid question, and some people say no, you should not. Dr. William Davis says, no, you don't, don't even talk to your doctor about nutrition. You don't need to. Many of the, the, the more naturopathically trained physicians say, you don't talk to a doctor about nutrition. That's dangerous. And sometimes that's actually true. So there's this thing in med school and in all of medicine, it's called the long white coat syndrome. And uh, <laughs> Nurse Everstein is very familiar with this. The, the more esteemed uh, a doctor is, the longer the white coat. Right? You start out in med school and you literally have a coat that hits you about here. It looks like a barber jacket. And then in residency, it comes to about mid-thigh. And then in attending, it looks like a cape. And then some of the most preeminent you know, authorities, it looks like Princess Diana coming down the aisle <laughs> with their train along behind them. And so independent thinking is actively discouraged in medical training. You don't ask probing questions because you'll, you'll get your wings clipped. That's a southern term. Anybody know what that means? Yeah. You get your wings clipped really quickly if you start asking too many probing questions. And so it leaves doctors in a very gullible position to really not know a damn thing about nutrition, but yet be expected by both themselves and their patients to be able to give nutritional advice. It's a very uncomfortable position for a doctor. And so typically they'll wind up saying something stupid because humans tend to do that when they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> now, we all know what a fad is, right? Let's talk about this. So anything that's new and becoming popular, we call that a fad. Anybody know what that picture is? Who, is that? who, who had a Furby? Don't be shy. <laughs> when you had your favorite Furby, you thought that was the coolest thing you'd ever had in your life, didn't you? Yes, did. Right. Where's your Furby now? <laughs> no, 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 that's right. Okay. <laughs> So fads are things that come and go, and they're not really based on any logic or meaning. They're just a, they're just a popular thing for a while. And so the keto, low-carb, carnivore diets have been like fad diets. 
because if you're looking at it from one paradigm, that's what it looks like. It looks like it just came out of nowhere, and it's probably going to go the way of the, the, the grapefruit died and the biggest loser and all that. It's just going to go away in a few years. Right? That's what it looks like to people on the outside looking in. But I would uh, opine that that is incorrect. The latest fad diet that we've been suffering from actually started in the 60s and 70s. And it's actually promoted by the federal government. Okay? It's approved by Big Pharma, it's approved by Big Food, and it's parroted by most doctors. Anybody know what this fad diet is? Sad. Sad diet. Yeah, it's a fad diet. Never in the history of humanity have we ever eaten a diet like that before. Okay? It was untested, the, the science behind it. A lot of the science was driven by this fellow, and we won't get into him. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. And so most of the research behind the SAD diet and behind the low-fat, high whole grain diet was just made up bunk. But when you're very influential and your long, your white coat looks like a train, you, people listen to you and they take what you say as gospel, even if it's based on nothing. So, from 1949 until 1977, this is from a study, the average American's diet consisted of 20 to 30 percent carbs, 40 to 50 percent fat, and 20 to 30 percent protein. Now, that don't look half bad, does it? That ain't bad. Well, and you remember back then there was no such thing as an obesity epidemic or type 2 diabetes epidemic. It's very rare, right? And I'm, I'm speaking out of school here because I wasn't alive then, but I've been told by people who should know that that's the case. Then starting in 77, the federal government got behind this fad diet and said, no, no, no. At least 55% of your calories from carbs. 30% or less from fat. And even out of that, it needs to be almost no saturated fat. And then 15 to 20% protein. And the obesity de epidemic began. Oh, no. It, yeah, it's doing the thing. Nice. I don't, I think I need you to fix it. <laughs> Do your thing. Watch this. Watch this. Okay. So let's see. Let me ask some questions. How many people here first heard about this way of eating by way of a friend or relative who shared a social media post? A video, a Facebook post, just two people? I don't believe you. No. I don't believe you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Does my wife count? Yes, your yes. wife counts. Yeah. Oh, she definitely counts. Yes. yes. My yes. husband. Yes. She counts. Excellent. Okay. And so, how many people here today feel like that this is kind of like a family reunion? Yeah. Right? Like you know these people even though you've never met them. And so my point is, people say, <laughs> many people say, oh, you can't develop meaningful connections and meaningful relationships on social media. And I would disagree with that. Obviously, you need to have face-to-face -face interaction with other humans, but you can develop very meaningful relationships. Um, before I met Danny Vega in person, I felt like we were brothers that had just never met. If you haven't bought the internet package yet, don't. <laughs> this is 2019, right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've been on other cruises than the, the internet was smoking. So I don't even I don't even want to hear their excuse. I'm not even going to the desk to talk to them about it. It's ridiculous. We'll have this up and running in just a second. Um, yeah, 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 let's do a question. Um, talk about this woman that approved yeah. uh, my carbs diet. They didn't know at this moment that it wasn't a They had no idea. And George McGovern, you're very familiar with this story, he said basically something to the effect of um, legislators don't have the luxury of waiting for all the evidence to be in. Quote, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what he said. We've got to put out some guidelines 
I don't have time to wait another 20 years for you guys to do the research. So oh, we're just going with this. And there were, back then, I know of at least one prominent doctor who was very, very against this fad diet that the federal government approved. But I think there was multiple doctors who, who test, they had testimony for days saying, this is stupid. You, this has never been tried in human beings. Did you have something to add? It was Michael DeBakey was yeah. actually yeah. a yeah. heart surgeon. And, and McGovern said, well, what could go wrong? <laughs> Wouldn't you lo love to grab his scruffy ass and bring him in the future and say, this is what could go wrong? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I was going to say, what about books like um, Western Prices, Nutrition and Degenerative Disease, that book, and also Campbell and Cleave and their book, The Satirite? Yeah, both very... Those were very well known at the time. That's exactly right. Completely ignored. And I don't know why doctors didn't put more stock in that that body of literature because it certainly existed. And Western Price was considered the, the foremost was. nutritionist. Of Absolutely. The and I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and a lot of people don't realize this, but doc, uh, medical doctors and dentists hate each other. Uh. Okay. In in med school, in and this is not this is a true story. In the uh, bathroom stall. A medical student had written the entire the entirety of the uh, curriculum of dental school. Number one, teeth are white. Number two, teeth are hard. Number three, teeth you chew with them. Congratulations, you're now a dentist. Oh, oh my God. And a dental student had replied, "Enjoy your medic Medicaid reimbursement, sucker." <laughs> True story. So there's always been this, and so I think he was a dentist, and a lot of doctors just there. And, and there's also a big problem with doctors not looking outside of their specialty, yeah. and definitely not, not looking outside of their field. And so there's beautiful evidence here, but it's completely <laughs> ignored because it was not put out by a preeminent Harvard MD. What about Catherine Cleve? Because they were both doctors. Yeah. Well. I'm not sure. I think a, a, probably a big part of it was we didn't have the social media no. that we could actually put pressure from the bottom up. They were, they absolutely. Their research mm, in the 1940s absolutely. During the Second World yeah, War. and actually, there's a lot of German res research. And I think a lot of that got squelched, and Gary Taubes talks about this too. It got squelched because you were German after World War II. Oh, yeah. 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 You could cure yeah. cancer, and nobody wanted to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And so, a lot of the really good nutrition research just got buried. Nobody wanted to talk about it. Because it was in German. Yeah. It was in German. And so, yeah. if you yeah. didn't read German, nobody was going to translate that because it was German. So, it was tainted by definition. But that's that's part of the problem. I can't believe one was British, one was South African. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there, but I think yeah. there was just no pressure from the bottom up yeah. for social media. I don't really know what to say about this Jimmy Moore. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. Um, I don't even know where to go. Okay, we'll keep asking questions. Who got a, anybody got a question? A statement. A statement. Yes. Yep. So, I mean, that's in my, guess, that's, I've got, yeah, yeah. And this is in here. I yeah. promise it is. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it is. And so, I don't know, are we So, are we, we have a question progress? online about yes. okay. fasting. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, no, fasting. Um, how important do you think fasting is for the keto lifestyle if you're trying to really get rid of fat? I think in certain situations, intermittent fasting is exceedingly powerful, right? Not everybody has to do that, but for, and, and most people, I think somebody said earlier, you just tend to start intermittent fasting if you're eating enough fat mm -hmm. to be satiated. You just tend to forget to eat because that's not your primary mover in your life anymore because you're not hungry constantly. But some people, type two diabetics, fatty liver, fatty pancreas, uh, anybody who's very metabolically ill, intermittent fasting is superbly powerful and Jimmy and Dr. Fung talk about that and the power of that in uh, the Complete Guide to Fasting. That's an excellent book. If you don't have that, you need to buy that today. Yeah, very powerful. Anybody? Come on, guys. Help me out here. Yes, sir. <laughs> in your research related to the education doctors receive on nutrition, did you uncover anything in other countries that they do it better? Any country do it better than us? I didn't actually look outside of the U.S., uh, but I would suspect some probably do it better and some do it just as bad. And it's a very weird thing. Many other countries in the world hate the United States, but they'll still adopt our guidelines instantaneously. <laughs> and I don't know why that is, right? And so literally it's somebody that we've just basically beat in a war and took all their stuff, 
and they'll still adopt the, the U.S. guidelines immediately. I don't, I don't really know why they do that. So in many countries, it's just a, a default. Whatever the U.S. whoever said, that's what we, that's what we do and what we believe. But I suspect there probably are countries who do it a little better. Yes, ma'am. Hello. Hi. Happy to be here. I'm uh, happy you're here. Yeah, I'm happy. So I have a question. Carnivore, is that okay? Can we jump that direction? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. in my opinion, the the low carb ketogenic diet. Let's do like remember the Venn diagram in in math class, right? It's this big oval, and within that oval, I think there there's a, a spectrum of keto low carb. Some people do great with lots of veggies. Right? So I think you can do a vegetarian keto pretty well if you're eating plenty of good eggs and butter and stuff like that. Other people have to keep basically dialing down the carbohydrate knob, right? Because if I eat 50 total grams or less a day, I would gain weight. That would happen. My A1C would start to go up and I'd start to get this again, right? And so I dialed it down to 20, which you could consider a fatty meat heavy keto, right? And that did better, but still I wasn't where I needed to be. And so I thought I would try carnivore, which I consider is one of the ultimate subsets of ketogenic diet. It's, it's definitely ketogenic. You can't eat carnivore and not be in ketosis most of the time. It's impossible. Uh, even with, if you lived on chicken breast, you'd probably be on the verge of being in ketosis all the time. <coughs> but for me, that was necessary to dial the carbohydrate knob down to under 10 total grams a day. That's cute. There's yours. There's yours. I ain't talking about that. That's later in the week. Thank you, Nisha. One more question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I want to thank you for writing the book, Doctor's Life's Told. Yep. Uh, Life's Doctor's Told. Yep. And I uh, have a young friend who just married a doctor who's on the verge of finishing his residency, going to go off and be a pediatrician in, in uh, Nebraska. Um, have you had a good response from doctors who have been gifted your book? Because I would like to give him your book, but I don't want to spend it. <laughs> Here's the thing, if you give that to an old gray-haired doctor, he's going to be offended. Okay. And that's okay, he needs to be offended. Okay. I, would, I would opine. But on, almost without exception, my experience has been that very young doctors, doctors still in residency, medical students, are eager to say, ooh, this is interesting, because they haven't forgotten how to learn yet. They're still in the, in the student mode, and that's where all doctors need to stay, but very often they stop being students. But if you know anybody in med school and in, in residency or even somebody who's just been out in practice a year or two, that book would be appreciated. Okay. And they might they may be like, oh, I'll check this out later. But after they read it, they're gonna be like, hmm, so you interesting. Have copies for sale on this ship today. I do I do not. I have two copies to give away that we brought, but I don't have any for sale. It's uh, on Amazon Prime, you can get it quick. It's on Amazon, it's on Barnes and Noble, everywhere that good books are sold. <laughs> But, and, but the people who are really catching on to this, gangbuster style, is nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, midwives, all the mid-level providers, because they need stuff that works, right? You can be at the upper echelon of medicine and not really pay attention to your patients, and you can be blind to the fact that every single one of your patients is getting sicker, and you're having to start a new medication, and their A1C is getting worse. You don't really look at that stuff. But when you're in the trenches, when you're primary care or a nurse or, or a mid-level provider, you look at that stuff you're with your own eyes every day and you quickly see, oh, this guy's keto and look at his A1C doing this number. And so all the mid-level providers also, I've gotten incredible feedback from mid-level providers and nurses, our registered nurses love this book because the Nisha and, and Nurse Everstein will be like, Doctors are stupid anyway, <laughs> right? The average doctor's a nincompoop, and that's why that's why they have a nurse to follow them around and go, no, 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 no. Let's not give that much. Let's just try it. Let's, yeah, exactly. Or they're they're over there looking in the in the the drug guide in Mosby's going, yeah, I don't think that's the right dose. Let's recalculate that, right? That happens all the time. Yeah, it says right here on their chart. They have an allergy to that, so let's not do that. Yeah, every day that happens in, in the real world. Oh, we're getting also, close. Also doing your slide. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Part of, the, part, of, yes. part of the problem with the doctors, uh, certainly with those that work with Kaiser on the West Coast, yeah. is that the hospital has a policy. Okay. Right. Not yeah. And that that's that's all about evidence-based medicine. And the. Yeah, I think so. And you can just make it big, and then I think we got it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Except it, it still says loading. So. Yeah, wait till it's really there and clap. So evidence-based guidelines should be based on good, meaningful evidence. But the problem is the hierarchy of evidence-based medicine. So if you've got a randomized controlled trial, then that's the that's it. Then that's what we go by. But if you don't have that, then doctors are very lackadaisical. So you can eventually keep coming down that pyramid and say, oh, here's, a, here's an epidemiological study that used food frequency questionnaires once back in 1985. That's all the research we got. Therefore, that is standard of care. And it's the truth. Yeah. And then there's actually another level below that that people don't realize, and it's called eminence-based medicine. And so if we have no research at all, we just go and ask one of the guys with the long white coat at Harvard. <laughs> And whatever he says, or we'll get a group of those guys, and whatever they decide, that is evidence. Not even kidding, that's the truth. That's how it's done. And there's a hierarchy of EBM, and at the very bottom it's called expert consensus. And that means we have no damn idea, but these three old smart guys think they know, so we're going to go with that and call that evidence. That's, that's how it's done. Okay, now, so back in 1977, the U.S. Senate and the Surgeon General and then the Nutrition for, and Your Health Dietary Guidelines, these three things came out and verified this bad diet. <coughs> and so you can imagine, everybody shut up. They're like, well, the, the U.S. Senate, the Surgeon General, I guess it must be right. You would be a kook if you at that point said, and so all the doctors just kind of zipped it and went about their business. And doctors like Dr. Atkins kept doing what they were doing, but they had no chance of ever reaching a nationwide authoritative position because this was the gospel and so they were by definition heretics so they couldn't get any they couldn't reach the number of people that needed to be reached to save the millions of lives that we've lost so here's a good question have doctors always given bad nutrition advice let's go let's go through a few things here so before the fad died back in 1824 this physicist Clement basically invented the calorie you guys all heard about calories a lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first law of thermodynamics, the total energy in a closed system is constant. Energy can be transformed from one form to another, but it can neither be created nor destroyed. That's why the calorie in, calorie out, calorie restriction, that's why you hear about all that stuff. But there's one thing that you need to pay careful attention to. Closed system. Is the human body a closed system? No. <laughs> That's right. I know. I drink something as I go out. Right? That's right. We're kind of like we're kind of like an, an empty paper towel tube. That's, what, that's literally the, the drawing you can draw in physiology because that's how we are. Plus, what about the heating in this room? Is that affecting your metabolic rate? Yes. What about the chair you're sitting on? Is that insulating part of your body but not all of it? Yes. What about the clothes you chose to wear today? Does that is that affecting? Yes. You see what I'm saying? Yep. There are thousands and thousands of variables for each person. And so I can take Miss Debbie. I can never, ever accurately calculate her total energy expenditure for us an hour, much less a day. It's an unknowable number because she's not a closed system. But if I had her in an insulated environment that was that had a foot of concrete and then another foot of this and, and right, you see what I'm saying? I could control every variable, then I could calculate that. But with just a human running around, it is impossible to know how many calories of energy they need a day. It's also impossible to know how many calories they burn a day. And it's also impossible to know how many actual calories are in that apple or that piece of broccoli you're actually about to eat. All of those numbers are estimatable only. You cannot ever know the true number. And so you're playing a reindeer game trying to count calories. You can, you can pretend all you want that my app said this and I looked it up in the book and it said that. You can never know those numbers, okay? And indeed, back in the day, doctors didn't talk about calories at all. Remember, the, and keep in mind, calories pretty much started being talked about in the scientific literature, 1824. So here is a, a physiology of taste book 
back in 1825. One can easily identify the cause of obesity after 30 years of talking with one fat individual after another who proclaimed the joys of bread, rice, and potatoes. The effects of this intake are exacerbated when sugar is consumed as well. Slimming is achieved by the more or less rigid abstinence from everything that is starchy or floury. 1825 they knew this, right? Did you see the word calorie mentioned there? 1844, this is a physician. All food which is not flesh, all food rich in carbon and hydrogen, that's a carbohydrate, must have a tendency to produce fat. This doctor said it must have a tendency to produce fat if it's a carbohydrate. That's interesting. Upon these principles only can any rational treatment for the cure of obesity satisfactorily rest. Carnivores are never fat, whereas herbivores, living exclusively on plants, often are. The hippopotamus, for example, I love this, so uncouth in form from its immense amount of fat, needs wholly, eats, uh, feeds wholly upon vegetable matter. Rice, millet, sugar cane. So uncouth in form. <laughs> so, he, did he mention calories? No. 1862, a surgeon says, knowing that a saccharine, that's not saccharine like the sw artificial sweetener, they used to call sugar saccharine, that's how they referred to it, and farinaceous, that means grain. So sugar and grain diet is used to fatten certain animals. And that in type 1 diabetes, the whole of the fat of the body rapidly disappears. That's the absence of insulin, right? So they knew this in 1862. It occurred to me that excessive obesity might be allied to diabetes as to its cause, and that if a purely animal diet were useful in the latter disease, a combination of animal food with such vegetable diet as contained neither sugar nor starch might serve to arrest the undue formation of fat. Did he mention calories? Mm -hmm. 1864, William Banting, you guys have heard of him, right? After losing 50 pounds, he said, I have not felt better in health than now for the last 26 years. Anybody can identify with that? Yes. Right, right? My other bodily ailments have become mere matters of history. Wow. He, didn't, he didn't count calories. Yeah. 1866. In the journal, now this is the good one right here. This is Lancet, the preeminent medical journal in the UK. After the Banting diet became popular, all the doctors were offended by it. And they said the following, the medical literature is tolerably complete and supplies abundant evidence that all of which Mr. Banting advises has been written over and over again. In other words, we've known that shit forever. <laughs> <laughs> so the Lancet Medical Journal basically said, duh. <laughs> right? Did they mention calories? No. So the, the, and so the Banting diet that was so controversial, at least we looking back now, that's the lens you view it through, they were the Lancet said, duh, yeah, of course, you cut out the carbs. That's how you lose weight, of course. 1882. Uh, Epstein said, fatty foods are crucial because they increase satiety and so decrease fat accumulation. Avoid sugar, sweets, and potatoes. Limit bread and vegetables. Meat of every kind may be eaten, and fat meat especially. Yeah. Yeah. 1882, he didn't mention, he forgot about calories. 1951, this is an actual a medical textbook, the practice of endocrinology. How many in here, did your endocrinologist is your least favorite doctor? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So foods to be avoided. Bread and everything else made of flour. Cereals, including breakfast cereals and milk puddings. Potatoes and all other white root vegetables and all sweets. Eat as much as you like. Meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, dried or fresh. I don't know what a dried egg is. They're nasty. I'm just going to powder eggs off. And then you can have some fruit except for bananas and grapes. So this was the textbook of endocrinology in 1951, and they forgot to mention calories. 1957, a psychoanalyst and obesity expert said, the great progress in dietary control of obesity was the recognition that meat was not fat producing, but that it was the innocent food stuff, such as breads and sweets, which lead to obesity. He also forgot to mention calories. 1962, a textbook on nutrition and dietetics. In Great Britain, obesity is probably more common among poor women than among the rich, perhaps because foods rich in fat and protein, which satisfy appetite, 
more readily than carbohydrates, are more expensive than the starchy foods, which provide the bulk of cheap meals. Once again, we don't see mention of the C word in this, do we? So, this is how I think about every single thing. Before I make a YouTube video or a Facebook post, I think about our ancestry, where we came from, how our ancestors ate. Then I think about the common sense of the situation. And then I look for meaningful research, not epidemiology with the food frequency questionnaire that was done once back in 1985. That's not meaningful research. And so based on these three things, then we can make knowledgeable statements and, and we can form hypotheses and maybe even theories. So here's the human timeline, and this is not to scale. If this were to scale, the first green arrow would be on the other side of that wall. That's how long we've been on this earth as homo sapiens sapiens. Okay? We started producing grain in any meaningful amount, growing it and, and milling it back about 12,000 years ago. Dairy came in about 8,000 years ago. Alcohol about four or 5,000 years ago. Before that, humans never had access to alcohol their entire life. Sad, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to my LDS friends. So there's Banting, you see where he came along in Osler, both of which believed in very, very low carbohydrate diets for weight loss. And then 1960 to 2019, that's our current fad diet. See that little red, our little green box? And then here we are today. So you understand, I'm when I'm talking about the ancestry of this, for 99.99999% of our time on this planet, we never ate the carbohydrates that are that is the current fad diet. We never did it. Our body's not used to it, it doesn't like it, it can't use it. It's poison. How many more people will die? And that's why I do what I do, right? I could have stayed in my little clinic in Camden and kept seeing 20 or 30 people every day and been happy, you know, paid the bills, knocked Nisha up, just lived my life, right? But it occurred to me after she said, you know, because I would come home just bitching about something that the American Medical Association of American Diabetes Association has said, and she said, why don't you shut up and make a YouTube video? So I did. But it occurred to me, this change is never going to come from the top down. It's never, never are we going to have a joint press conference between the American Medical Association and the American Diabetes Association where they say, you know that eat all the whole grains and avoid saturated fat thing? Shit. Ah, we were wrong. Sorry. <laughs> that will never happen. That will never occur. Right? What they're going to do at the top is they're going to slowly back away quietly and things are going to disappear off the American Diabetes Association website. That picture of the whole grain pancakes with the syrup and the orange juice that, <laughs> that I tried, I was going to post it on Twitter and I went to the ADA website to get it and it was gone. <laughs> right? That's how they're going to handle this because none of these guys with this long white coat ever want to stand in front of a microphone and say, I was, I was ignorant. I, I thought I knew what I was talking about, but I didn't know what I was talking about. Sorry. Millions of people are going to die if we wait for that press conference. Millions of legs will be lost. Millions of more people will be on dialysis. We'll lose mothers and fathers and grand, grandparents. We'll lose brothers and sisters that we didn't have to lose if we wait for the top to do this. That's why we got to do this. That's why you guys are here today, and that's why I'm here today. And I want to know what role are you going to play? Because all some of you guys have got a social media presence, but all of you guys got a story that people need to hear. And quite often, the most embarrassing, painful story to talk about is the very story that somebody needs to hear. They need to hear you be real and raw and say, I used to be this, and here's a picture. Oh my God, I can't believe I just posted that. And then now here, here's me now, and I'm a different person. People need to see that. They need to hear that. And the first time they see it, they're going to ignore it. The tenth time, they're going to go, what is this? And the hundredth time they see it, they're going to Google it. And then you just won. Because what we're talking about here is the proper human diet. So, what should you do? And you're doing it right now. You're learning. You're leading by quiet example. And for the husbands in the audience, I would stress the quiet part of the example. <laughs> right? You lead by showing. You don't lead by telling. Shut your mouth and just do it. At some point, when she's sick and tired of your progress, she'll say, okay, smart ass, 
What are you doing? How do you do this? Well, okay, I'm ready. Te teach me. That'll happen. And then you're going to share, and you're going to share it on every possible way you can. Word of mouth, of course, but you're also going to share it on social media because we have a power now that we've never had in the history of humanity, right? A little doctor in Camden, Tennessee can reach thousands and thousands of people. And it ain't because I'm special, I guarantee. It's just because I won't shut up. <laughs> but you can be the same way. How many people in here, raise your hand if you've saved a life. Who saved a life? And I don't mean you put in a chest tube and started a, a, a karate catheter. I'm talking about you happened to somebody and they said, oh, I didn't know that. And then they did something and they got healthier. Let me see them again. Don't be shy. I want to know. Everybody in this room can raise your hand to that question. Every single person can eventually say yes to that question. You just got to quit being a church mouse and you got to tell your story because it's powerful. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. But you got to tell your truth or you'll never help anybody. <coughs> Videos, articles, conferences, podcasts, books. That's how you learn this stuff. And there's what you do. Teach your doctor. Get him my book. As Carl Franklin says, if you can't change your doctor, change, change your doctor. doctor. Change your doctor. That's exactly right. So, and then you're going to share, right? So currently, the dog is the FDA. And we are the cat. But it doesn't have to always be that way. You know how many smartphones there are in the world right now? How many smartphones? Two billion. Next, by the end of next year, there's going to be two and a half billion smartphones. Now, I'm talking about they can whip out their phone and get up Facebook. Stop being shy. Stop saying, I could never tell anybody that. That I used to do that or I used to look that way. I could never, I could never. Stop that. There are people in other countries whose life you will save who you never meet. That's the power that we've got with social media. Okay? So don't, don't spurn that power. It's very, very powerful. Now let's talk about some language. <laughs> language. So maybe as we go through this journey, instead of talking about the low-carb or the ketogenic diet, what if we started calling it the proper human diet? <laughs> then when somebody jumps on a Facebook Live and says, yeah, but what if I don't have a gallbladder? Can I eat the proper human? Oh, never mind. Of course. <laughs> right? But I've got psoriasis. Can I eat the proper heat? Oh, never mind. Right? See how that one shift in the language it completely changes the conversation. This is what human beings should eat. Some variation <clears throat> of the ketogenic diet, whether it's veg heavy or whether it's carnivore. Somewhere in there is the diet for every human on this planet. we got to tweak and we got to play and we got to find that diet but once you've found it, that's it. Will your diet change as you get older? Yep, probably. Will it change as you, as you gain or lose weight? Yep, probably. But that's okay because somewhere in that range is the proper human diet for you. And that will just shut up a lot of questions. Now, let's also stop calling it bulletproof coffee. If you use a fatty coffee or a fatty tea for, for fasting, let's call it keto coffee or keto tea. So we get the name brand out of there. And then, most importantly, let's stop talking about weight loss. Thank you. Let's start talking about fat loss. Raise your hand if you want to lose muscle. <laughs> You're so small, you want to get rid of some muscle. I don't mean in your head. <laughs> Nobody wants to lose muscle. Do you want to lose bone? No. No? You want to lose fat. You want to lose fat. You don't want to lose weight. And I, it seems like that's just a minor detail, but I promise you, when we start talking like that, it makes it very much harder for our for our, our colleagues and our friends and neighbors to argue with us, right? Because if you say it's a weight loss or I'm losing weight, then immediately you start hearing, oh, you're going to lose muscle mass, right? But if you're on a fat loss diet, obviously it ain't you ain't going to it's it you lose fat. Does that make sense? So so mind your language. We can actually confiscate this argument. We can confiscate the entire nutrition argument by using the right language. We can make it ours. And then they've got to come to us to have the discussion instead of us yelling out into the wilderness. Does that make sense? What about what about diabetes, type 2 diabetes? 
is that a disease? Or is that just chronic carbohydrate overdose? Think about that for those are the, when you phrase that, that's a completely different conversation you're having at that point, right? Do you have fatty liver disease? Or do you just have carbohydrate poisoning? And you need to cut the carbs. Because those things disappear when you get your carbs where they need to be. Unless you're an alcoholic, and that's a whole different diagnosis, right? That's alcohol poisoning. That also will give you fatty liver, right? So you've got to mind your languages, and we've got to start owning this conversation. It belongs to us because we've used it to change our lives. And we can use it to change millions of other lives if we control the conversation. That's it, guys. Thank you very much. Dr. King Berry.